Yes. All right. So uh, it's 701, so I'll kick this off. Uh, I'm Phil Monahan. I am the manager of the Orvis News website, which includes our fly fishing blog and our dog blog. Um, and I'm joined today by my own personal vet, my dog's personal vet, uh, Dr. Bo Bergman from the West Mountain Animal Hospital in, are you in Bennington or Shaftesbury? Bennington officially. In Bennington, Vermont. Um, so Bo, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, could you just take a minute or two to introduce yourself and yep. talk about Absolutely. what you do? Well, thank you to Phil and Orvis for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Bo Bergman. Uh, I am a co-owner of West Mountain Animal Hospital. We're a five doctor, um, small animal practice in Southern Vermont. And I've been there for about 11 years now. Um, grew up there. Both my parents were veterinarians, so I've kind of taken over for them. And um, I've had the opportunity to work with Orvis a little bit. I did a few uh, blog posts years ago and uh, did a little uh, first aid course up at their uh, store during uh, dog days last fall. So it was fun. So when Phil brought up, uh, hey, you want to do something new and try this, you know, live stream, uh, you know, talk about the summertime stuff, I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I'm ready for it. Okay. Well, uh, let's kick things off. It was 90 degrees here in Vermont today. So uh, I'm sure one of the first things that um, comes to mind is what kind of problems does this level of heat, and I assume humidity comes into play as well, uh, create for dogs? Yeah, great question. And Vermont has been having to deal with it a lot more this summer. The, uh, you know, I think those of you in the southern states, you know, you're kind of prepared for this early on. Well, we kind of went from snow in May, and then June hit, and it was humid and in the 80s very quickly. And so when you haven't had time to acc uh, acclimatize to uh, warm weather, that's one of the biggest problems you get. Um, but, you know, we're seeing certainly lots of these heat cases where you have, um, oh, we have a radish. Thank you. Here's, here's one of my dog's radish. She'll probably make an appearance here and there. Um, but yeah, so, uh, Heat is a big issue. You know, you hear a lot about it with uh, cars and just how quickly things can uh, change in cars. But even on a 80 degree day, overcast, uh, you can still have dogs who come into issues with uh, heat stroke. You know, if they're too active, if they're anatomically not built for heat. So think about all your uh, short nosed breeds, pugs, French bulldogs, things like that. Um, they just can't. Um, uh, exchange their heat as well as, as some of these other dogs through their panting mechanisms. And you got to remember dogs uh, don't sweat like you and me. So we don't perspire or they don't perspire and, you know, uh, get their excess heat off. Um, they have to pant. Um, and if they're panting already hot air, that's already moist air, there's no way for them to exchange that heat. And so their, their temps can go up uh, really quickly. So, Many of you probably already know some of the signs for heat stroke. Um, you know, we worry about, you know, panting. Well, every dog pants, right? So that's not too useful, but it's when they're panting excessively. They're drooling and that drool is like this thick kind of drool. It's not your normal, normal drool. Um, they get glassy eyed. Um, their tongue and lips might get red. Uh, and then, you know, if you have a thermometer, their temp's going up as well. Um, and this can progress to, you know, vomiting and even to seizures. So heat stroke's a real thing. Um, we had a dog in today at our clinic. And so with the pandemic, we're doing curbside service. And so we go out to the owner and their pet in the parking lot and we talk to them and then we bring the dog in, do an exam on the dog, and then go back out and, and talk to the owner about what we found. And there's one dog, a French bulldog. You know, it was probably uh, one o'clock this afternoon. So right at the, the top of the heat. And as we're talking to the owner, you could just tell he's getting more worked up, more worked up, panting, gums started turning red, that sort of thing. So by the time we got him into the AC, he was already kind of too worked up. So we, we asked the owner if we could just wash him. We gave him some water, put a fan on him. Um, his temp had been up uh, high and it came back down. 
So you might ask what uh, a good or what a normal temp is and how do you take a temp? So generally dogs last between um, or stay between 99 and 103. So excited dog can be up at 103. Different than humans, right? Phil, your temp would be what? Yep. 98.6. That's right. So dogs, um, they kind of fluctuate a little bit more, mainly because they, you know, uh, don't thermoregulate as well as we do. They don't have all of our skin to perspire through. So they can go from 99 to 103 pretty easily. Um, but once you get over that 103, you start having um, organs that aren't functioning well. And if you stay at a high level, um, then you can get uh, a really, really sick dog. Um, so uh, you want them to stay under 103. You know, if you have an excited dog who's uh, running around, they might be at 103. That doesn't necessarily mean they have heat stroke. So you got to look for those other clinical signs as well. Um, so yeah, this this uh, French bulldog, you know, good good ending to the story. I mean, you know, cooled down you know, very quickly, could get its vaccines, and then you know, when it went home, it went straight into the AC car instead of hanging out outside while we were, while we were chatting with the owner. Right. Now is, um, does it have to be 90 degrees out for a dog to be affected by heat? No, not at all. So, you know, it can be overcast. It can be, um, uh, cooler temps, um, and they can still be affected by the heat. I see it a lot in some of these older dogs. You know, I get a, a dog who's got heat stroke and they've come in to me and the owner said, well, you know, we were out just for a short time and it's not that hot out yet. And, you know, it's overcast. Well, that, that doesn't really matter. It really matters whether the dog is, um, you know, getting worked up and, and is he able to cool down uh, sufficiently enough. So tips on, um, you know, how to prevent that from happening, right? Well, the easy thing is to keep your dog in air conditioning or keep them in a cool place. Well, life of a dog isn't, isn't that fun when, you know, they're, they're stuck inside. So we, uh, you know, we need to exercise our dogs. They want, they want that. They want to be outside. They need to go use the bathroom, that sort of thing. Um, so choosing the time of the day you go is really important. So generally the mornings are the coolest. Um, you know, if, if you can't do it in the mornings, then waiting until later in the day. Now, I'm not saying don't go outside at all, uh, you know, with your dog. I mean, they can go out for short little bits. You just don't want to go throw the tennis ball for them or make them go around the block. And, uh, you know, because they will get you know worked up. And if you are digging a walk around the block, you want to make sure you got water with you. Let them cool down. Um, you can even spray them down with some water, you know, just kind of keep them cool. Uh, and then. Um, you know, they make lots of different things too, right? So Phil, I don't know if you've seen any of these where they have, um, you know, cooling vests or mm -hmm. portable, you know, fans to put on your dog. I mean, there's lots of, lots of things out there. And, um, you know, some of them are, are, you know, really nice. And if you got a dog who's, you know, doesn't mind wearing a jacket or something, you know, put a cooling vest on them and, and, you know, that's pretty good. So say it's, uh, you know, I'm in Vermont, we don't have AC in my house. Um, you know, but we do have the fans going and we don't let the dogs, you know, go sit in the sun sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, having fans, they make cooling mats to, to lay on, uh, for your dog. Um, I don't know if Orvis has any of those that they sell with their dog beds or something like that, but that's, that's a pretty neat thing I've seen. Um, and, uh, yeah, fans are, fans are a great way because it does bring in the, um, uh, the air to exchange through their panting. Now I've, I've heard something. I don't know if it's an old wives tale, but someone told me that you never give a dog ice water. Well, I I'm comfortable giving them ice water. I mean, there's, there's debate on whether you should give them ice because that can be bad for their teeth. If you got a dog with uh, fragile teeth, you could fracture those teeth. So you don't want to necessarily, you know, I, my dogs have eaten ice cubes and not fracture their teeth. So that's kind of what I tell my parent, my patients is that, um, you know, it's, it's a risk you take if you want to let them have some ice cubes. But, um, so that is a great question. So say, say that, you know, even with all these preventative tips we just talked about, you still get a dog who is uh, going through heat stroke. You know, they're having these clinical signs of, drooling this thick drool or panting they can't get calmed down they're starting to get glassy eyed you take their temp and they're 105 degrees 
what do you do? Well, you cool them down and you don't want to cool them down with ice water. So that might be what you're thinking of. Um, the ice water is uh, too much of a contrast and can actually make their, um, their vessels vasodilate or vasoconstrict. So it gets, you know, where there's no blood flow going to the surface and then you're not exchanging that heat that you're trying to get out of the body. So they talk about tap, tap water or lukewarm, not lukewarm, mm -hmm. you know, kind of cool water, but, um, nothing like with ice, not an ice bath. You don't want to do that. Um, if you got a little dog, that's easy, you know, put them in the, into the sink or the bathtub. If you got a bigger dog, um, you talk about, you know, hosing them down with a hose, you can wrap them around, uh, with a wet uh, towel, you know, cool them down. Um, you know, in the hospital, we will take some alcohol and put it on their belly because that's a nice evaporative, uh, cooling substance. Um, and then I get them to your veterinarian because we do worry about organ dysfunction and things. And so those dogs, you know, even once you cool them down, they still may need some uh, fluids or supportive care. So what would be the, the absolute red flags for you that says your dog needs to go to the vet? Aside, I, I'm assuming most people don't have a dog thermometer. Right. Okay. That's a good, well, you should go, go out and get one, you know, I label, am now. I label am. it dog, you know, cause you don't want any humans using it after you've done a, a rectal temp. The, um, yeah. So, uh, when, when is the, what's the trigger to, to take you into the, um, uh, hospital? Um, I would do it if your dog's not cooling down. So if he goes, runs out, you know, comes in, gosh, he's panting, he's a little red. Well, put him in front of a fan, let him drink some water. If he, you know, chills out in the next few minutes, then you're good to go. If, uh, if he's, you know, not cooling down and it's been, you know, 15 minutes of him just panting and looking stressed, time, time to call your vet and, and try and get him uh, seen right away. Yeah. And do the traditional winter breeds, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bernese mountain dogs and huskies and stuff, do they, tolerate the heat less than others? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say they do. I mean, again, it's, it's all how they've been acclimatized, right? I mean, you can take a, um, a Vishla and, you know, who's used to 50 degrees and cooler temps and then put them in 90 degrees humidity and they think they can do their five mile run, but you know, they're just not going to be able to exchange that heat as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, definitely the, the, you know, there's certain breeds out there who uh, um, are more prone to it. I worry a lot about the um, the the short nosed ones, like I mentioned, the uh, the you know the pugs, the French bulldogs, um, mm -hmm. Shih Tzus, you know all all those sorts of ones who just don't have a whole lot of space in their nose to kind of make sure they're panting well. Interesting. So we have a question. Can you read that at the bottom of your screen? Sure. And can everyone see that or uh, do I need to? Uh, I think everyone can see it, but why don't you read it? Yeah. So uh, sidewalks, right? So, you know, we're in, we're in Vermont. There's not a whole lot of sidewalks here. So you're usually walking on, you know, grass or uh, uh, dirt roads, that sort of thing. But when you are on a sidewalk, it's it's pretty, um, it can burn their, their feet. And uh, I actually saw a dog this week for, um, had been on some concrete over the weekend. We had a nice 4th of July weekend here been running around in the concrete and um, actually, uh, you know, removed the bottom part of uh, his pads. So, I mean, ideally, you'd um, avoid that really hot part of the day. Um, but if you need to go out uh, when it's hot like that, then um, I'd be doing some booties. And there's lots of booties out there. I don't necessarily have any favorites, but one that, you know, is, is probably insulated on the bottom, you know, a little rubber tread and, uh, you know, your dog tolerates. Some are better than others about, you know, letting some dogs are better than others than letting uh, letting you put something on their feet. Others won't tolerate it and just you know roll over and put their feet up in the air. So. And if a, if a dog looks like it's having hot paws but it doesn't maybe look too bad, what would you put on it? I don't know if I'd put anything on it. You know, again, cooling them down, right? So dogs do perspire through their pads a little bit uh, or interdigitally. So um, you know put them in some in a little kiddie pool of, of water, you know, isn't a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, are there other types of paw injuries that you see, particularly in the summertime? 
Um, yeah, I mean, we certainly see a lot of uh, paw injuries. You know, dogs tend to be more active during the summer uh, outside, so they're they're breaking nails, they're you know getting thorns stuck in their pads. Um, you know, and, and that's something that we can certainly talk about a little bit later. But you know, kind of seasonal stuff. I mean, allergies are one of the big things that. Um, you know, dog ends up licking their paw, you know, cause they're got some allergy to it. And, uh, um, they start coming up with lesions on their feet and then they're limping and then they're walking on dirty ground and getting bacterial infections. And yeah, it can be a, be a big mess. So, uh, as usually happens in these types of things, although our, our subject is about summer, we do have some questions that, uh, people I'm sure are, um, just want to know because they have a, the ear of a veterinarian. Yeah, so uh, Mike from Connecticut wants to know, are there any specific immunizations that should be considered if the dog is a pond or lake swimmer? Yeah, great, great question. So if you got a dog who likes water and is in and around water a lot, there's a vaccine for leptospirosis, which is a bacteria transmitted by um, water, uh, by wildlife when they usually pee into standing water. Um, so that's going to be the worst sort of water to be in. So kind of swampy water or a um, uh, mud puddle, you know, even in the city, you know, you can have rats or raccoons or deer uh, that end up peeing in that the dog takes a drink or gets uh, has a cut on their paw and they go through the water. Um, so that's a great vaccine to talk to your veterinarian about. Um, there's uh, lots of other vaccines out there. Um, none that are specific necessarily for, um, you know, the pond or, or lake swimming. Uh, the one thing we do see up here and that I'm starting to worry about just how hot it's been in Vermont is we see some blue green algae toxicity. So on certain ponds or lakes, um, you can start getting a, a fungal overgrowth that um, can has some, I forget what they're called, cyanotoxins that can be pretty deadly to, to our dog. So if you, so I don't tell my clients to avoid swampy, um, algae ridden water, uh, you know, with your dog, just cause you don't want to take that risk. So uh, a pond but... covered in green slime is, should be no go. Yeah. I mean, and they're going to stink afterwards too. Right. So, uh, you want to avoid that. And, uh, you brought up another issue that, uh, I saw a friend of mine on Facebook, my nephew actually just adopted a dog, first dog he's ever owned by himself. And his question was, is it okay to let my dog drink puddle water? Yeah, I mean, dogs have got to be dogs, right? Um, so I recommend against it, but, you know, I also want uh, want you to have some fun with your dog and not be having to, like, you know, scold them every time you walk by a puddle. Um, so this is where that lepto vaccine would be perfect, you know, uh, to, to help out. You know, there's other parasites, things like Giardia and Coccidia that we worry about. Um, so, you know, the thing is, dogs uh, and even cats are are low to the ground. Their nose is, you know, picking up stuff all the time, and and unfortunately, they're they're ingesting a lot of the the stuff on the ground as well. Okay, we have a completely different question from Brandy. What is the best CBD oil treatment for joint issues? She has a fourteen year old Boston with old dog syndrome. Old dog syndrome. So I'm not sure what old dog syndrome is, but if it's just an old dog, which 14 years old is, is pretty good. So um, there is uh, CBD oil for those people who don't know. So CBD is um, uh, part of the marijuana plant. It's a non-psychoactive uh, ingredient. So you don't have some of the um, uh, other things that you would think about with uh, having uh, marijuana, right? Um, and there's lots of information out there um, and exciting studies showing that it can help uh, in a lot of different ways. So um, uh, we've seen it uh, be helpful with seizures, with appetite stimulation, with um, just mobility. And it's actually something I used uh, for my old girl when she was kind of nearing the end of her her life. And, um, you know, we were already giving her a lot of the traditional medications and we added in the, the CBD to kind of help with her appetite and make sure, you know, um, we were doing everything we could for her, for her old joints. Um, 
So if the question is what brand I use, I use the one um, called Elvet. It's E-L-L-E, -L -L um, based out of Portland, Maine. So good, good company. They do some um, partnership with um, uh, Cornell doing some studies. So uh, we felt it was a reputable group. You'll see, you know, CBD sold pretty much everywhere, uh, including like gas stations, at least around here in Vermont. And um, when we started seeing that happening and people were coming in, uh, you know, saying, oh, yeah, I gave my dog some CBD. There's a lot of different uh, qualities out there. So, um, you know, be careful on which one you're giving and, you know, make sure it's actually got some CBD in it. I've uh, I've put the web address of Elvet in the comments for folks who want to check that out. I have used CBD for my own joints. Uh, so I assume that dogs can get the same sorts of benefits that yep. I did. Yep. And the Elvet is a, an oral liquid um, and it comes in a chew, chew as well. So, you know, um, and they have a chew that's made specifically for um, joint and mobility. Um, so I don't think we can talk about summer heat without talking about cars and dogs in cars. Sure. Um, it, it always sort of astonishes me that there are people who still don't know that leaving your dog in the car is a bad thing. Yeah. Um, do you still see that? Yeah, we do. I, more often on accident, um, you know, and that's where, you know, we got people who are, you know, thinking about other things, you know, pandemic or whatever, you know, and, they uh, they just forget their dog or, you know, go run a quick errand and don't realize how hot it is or that the shade moves away and all of a sudden their dog's in the sun. And um, so, yeah, I mean, in an enclosed space, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'm sure there's lots of you know, good images out there, but um, that, you know, show you just how quickly the, the temp rises in a enclosed car. And so, you know, even if it's 70 degrees outside, it can still get up to 90s 80s and you got a hum humid issue and, and then all of a sudden your your dog's going through heat stroke so we um again we're we're in vermont where you know generally it's only in the you know 80s 90s for part of the summer um but again we've been in you know this kind of sort of weather since june and um it's definitely uh you know kind of we got to be extra careful and you trained in the South, correct? So Correct, yeah. So I did my schooling at uh, North Carolina State University. So it's probably an even bigger issue there, or especially in the Southwest, I would think. Yep, absolutely. So if you take your dog out in the, in the car on a hot day to go run an errand, do you just not do that? Or what do you do? Do you leave the car running? What do you do? You know, I see some of these cars where you can have a dog mode to have the AC on while you're not in there and stuff like that, which is great, you know, as long as it works. I just don't trust that, you know, it's going to be perfect. So I, I recommend not taking your dog. Uh, you know, after work today, I ran to the grocery store. So I didn't take my dog to work today because I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep him in the car sort of thing mm -hmm. uh, on my way home. So, yeah, I, I avoid, you know, taking them. Um, and then, you know, there's definitely going to be some gray zone, right? So what if I can park in the uh, shade? What if it's windy out? What if it's not that humid? I just play it safe, you know, it's my my profession is to to keep them as healthy as we can so mm -hmm. I'm not going to recommend you leave your dog in the car okay so the other uh and this this came up a little bit with the uh the algae covered ponds is what kind of insect parasite problems should we worry about before we started this facebook live i noted that i hadn't seen any ticks recently yep. and you said yeah, so that's pretty typical of Vermont. Um, our tick seasons tends to be in the spring and the fall. They tend to like the warm days and cooler nights. So once you have a you know a warm night, you know sixty degrees, they tend to kind of hide more. Now that said, we can still see ticks, and I saw a tick just the other day. Um, so they're still out. They're just not out in droves like we see them um, in the spring and the fall. Uh, so yeah, so you know, parasites are a big issue during the summer, right? So ticks, especially. Um, I think we're about to start seeing a lot of fleas as well. Um, you know, fleas like warm weather to replicate in, and so uh, you know, I bet you we're going to start seeing a lot more flea cases if you don't have your dog or cat on on a preventative. Um, um, 
this is kind of a stupid question, but where do the fleas come from? From your neighbor, from, from the other stray cat who came to your front door. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're around and um, they have an interesting life cycle where they can um, lay thousands of eggs, you know, all at once. And then they, you know, move on and die. But those eggs, you know, can, can stay dormant for a while. And so, um, you know, I tend to see in, in wintertime, those eggs, you know, it can be three months later and they hatch out into the larval form and then turn into the fleas a little more rapid in the summer. So that's why, you know, that's why I'm expecting to see some more uh, flea issues. And what are your preferred methods for flea and tick prevention? Great. So um, there's lots of different ones out there. Um, we uh, at our clinic have just a few of them just because it would be overwhelming to try and stock everything. Um, but we do keep a variety of um, oral flea and tick preventative. So a pill that a dog or cat um, or dog can swallow. Um, we also have the topical and we also have the collar. So Soresto collar is the one that I like. Um, the uh, uh, pill that we use is called Symperica. It lasts for 30 days. And then um, the uh, topical we use is called Vectra 3D. So another another nice product, similar to uh, Advantix 2, which a lot of people know about. And how do you determine which one or which combination of them is effective? It's often based on the dog's lifestyle um, or the owner's preference. So some owners don't want anything on the outside of their dog. So that nixes the uh, Soresto collar, nixes the uh, um, topical that goes on the on the back. If you got a lot of cats in your house, then you don't use the Vectra or the Advantix because that can be toxic to cats. Um, and uh, you know, some have more repellent properties. You're not allowed to really say they repel ticks, but that they you know are less likely to have the tick bite um, than than others. Mm -hmm. uh, the Vectra 3D does a nice job with biting flies. So for these, you know, especially short haired dogs who are in kind of a area where there might be black flies or mosquitoes, um, they, uh, you know, um, that it helps keep those little fly bites off. So. so it sounds to me like ask your vet is the, probably the proper answer for your, your vet will be the best source to, you know, know who you are and who your pet is and, and how that can be. Right. I'm pretty sure that PD, my dog, who's very much an outdoor dog is Soresto plus Imperica. Yeah, exactly. And you'll want that during the really bad uh, tick seasons for sure. So here's a question from Christina. We have a lab setter mix. He licks his paws constantly for years now. We fed him pricey foods and cheap foods. Nothing seems to work. He's also susceptible to ear issues. Can his paw licking be anxiety as he never licks till raw or see any sores? And it seems to be worse in the summer. Perfect. So sounds like an allergy case. And these are things that we talk about uh, during exams. And, and those discussions can last for you know, 30, 40 minutes because it's a big, big topic and there's a lot of things that play into it. So you touched on um, food. Um, that's certainly one of our things that uh, we see dogs being allergic to. Um, and also you mentioned um, that it's worse in the summer. So that's more of a seasonal allergy more likely that it's going to be an environmental thing. So depending on what sorts of pollens are around, that sort of thing. So the, um, uh, and then there's a whole category called atopy, which is just, they're allergic to life pretty much is what we kind of joke about that no matter how much we work up the diagnosis of trying to determine whether they're um, dealing with uh, food versus environmental, they're just allergic. So there's uh, things we can do. Um, you know, uh, and that's best addressed with your uh, veterinarian. I like the fact that you don't want to diagnose a dog you haven't seen. Um, Scott McEnany, whom we both know very well, he's hey, a colleague at Orvis and practically a neighbor of, of Bo. Uh, is there something you can give a dog that is showing advanced signs of heat problems and can't cool quickly? He's heard honey and sugars might do the trick. Yeah, I don't know anything about honey or sugars. Um, the uh, and I imagine you mean feeding them honey or sugar. Um, 
I would I would recommend that. So um, Scott, we talked about um, you know uh, how to fix them quickly. You know uh, some cold water, not not freezing cold, no uh, no ice or anything like that, but some uh, cooler water. You know that they can sit in, or you wrap them up in, or hose them off with um, is one of the best ways. And then get a big fan in front of their face so they can pant it off as well as uh, um, uh, evaporate from their uh, from their skin. So aside from ticks and fleas and biting flies, what are some of the other bugs or microorganisms right. we need to think about during the summer? Yeah, so I mean, we're seeing um, a lot of intestinal parasites, right? So you hear about roundworms, hookworms, tapeworms, things like that. And they're more prevalent uh, during the summer, you know, more dogs out there eating things off the ground that they shouldn't be, you know, like poop uh, and uh, and then getting, you know, these parasites from it. Um, and the other one um, is heartworm uh, disease. So uh, those of you in the south probably are much more familiar with this than uh, those in the north. Um, heartworm is a uh, parasite transmitted by mosquitoes and it goes into dogs' hearts and can clog up their heart and give them heart disease. Um, so this is a, a bigger problem down south because their mosquito season is longer. Um, the, the heartworm actually, the larvae needs to incubate inside the mosquito for a number of days before they can actually be infective towards another dog. So, you know, up here, you know, it used to be not as big an issue because our, you know, season was pretty short, but gosh, again, I go back to this uh, climate that we are in right now where it was really hot starting in June and it's, it's you know, now middle of July and it's still hot and I imagine August is going to be more of the same. So um, I did have a, um, a patient the other day, a one-year-old dog who was not on heartworm prevention and um, she came to us with heartworm disease. And this is a dog who has not been down south. Um, so she got got it from um, from a dog in this area. Um, so it is out there. We do recommend doing heartworm disease year round or heartworm preventative year round. Um, I tell my clients that's mainly because of the intestinal parasite component to it because dogs are always eating things off the ground. But the uh, the heartworm component is most important during the summer when we have uh, mosquitoes going around. So that's a, that's a big one. And that's bigger. You know, I'm talking to more people about it and emphasizing that it is around and, uh, you know, we can't ignore that um, and just hope our dog doesn't get it because it ends up being uh, costly for the dog, costly for the owner. It's more expensive treatment and um, and can leave permanent damage to the lungs and to the to the heart. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, that's no fun. Um, are there any uh, non sort of microbial problems that dogs who spend a lot of time in water get? I mean, do you worry about ears or anything like that? Or is it? Yeah. Hard? I mean, real quick, I got a, a funny one about my own dog who I took over to the main coast uh, two years ago for um, his first experience in ocean water. And I had brought fresh water as bowl, you know, and he didn't want anything to do with the fresh water. He just kept going and drinking out of the salt water which made him incredibly sick. And the drive back to Vermont was no fun because we had to keep letting him out. And I kept panicking whether I needed to like take him to a hospital on the way home and, and that sort of thing. He ended up being fine. But um, but yeah, that's that's one thing. I mean, you want fresh water to drink out of, avoiding the algae and things like that. Um, and then going back to, um, I mean, you, you worry about drowning, right? So if you've got a dog who's not used to swimming or get stuck underneath a pool cover or, you know, things like that, you know, you got to be careful um, with that. The, um, and then you mentioned ear problems. That's all kind of balled up in that allergy question, right? So um, I think one of your things you want to talk about was, you know, what are the things I'm seeing, you know, during the summer months? Well, allergies is a big one, you know, because we do have even a dog who's on, who's, you know, has a food allergy, their immune system is just a little more sensitive. So they can be also predisposed to um, other allergies as well. And so, you know, we're dealing with a lot of ear infections and that's often brought on by a, uh, an allergy, um, whether it's to food or whether it's just the environment. Um, you get too much water in the ear, you get a floppy dog ear where, you know, uh, doesn't allow it to dry. 
and um, it can build up into wax and debris and then the, you know, the yeast and the bacteria start having a party in there and reproduce too much and you know give your dog an ear infection same with the feet same with armpits um, you know belly groin area um, you know those are those are a lot of the, the things we're seeing right now hopefully not too many flea allergies you know because we got um, you know we're trying to get all of our clients to to keep on a regular flea preventative but you know we even have our inside cats who still get fleas because you know there's a stray cat who comes to the door or there's a, a neighbor who comes over and you know their dog had fleas and, and brought a flea with them and then that flea you know lays down a thousand eggs and you know a few weeks later you have a, a flea problem in your house yeah that happened well i mean we don't have a neighbor for a hundred yards in any direction and we somehow pd managed to get fleas i was shocked yeah right and you know you wouldn't think that you would just get it you know from the uh from the environment but it just depends on what animals gone through there you know uh before before pd did so here's another summertime one uh that we're dealing with now uh, my dog PD is a uh, terrier poodle mix. He's very terrier-like, very brave, very pugnacious. He's, we think, between seven and eight. He's a rescue. Last year, out of nowhere, he developed thunderstorm anxiety. So, great one. Temperature nice. starts. Temperature starts to drop. Pressure starts to drop. Farthest rumble, and he just starts to shake. Yep. And um, that's a great one. Noise phobia. You know, I grouped that with uh, fireworks as well. And we just came off a weekend that was very busy with fireworks. And Phil, I don't know what it's like around your house, but uh, I feel people are stuck in their homes and bored and just lighting off fireworks everywhere. Because I feel like the season started, you know, several weeks ago and, and just lots of fireworks going off, you know, which is great, you know, good celebration. But for our dogs, uh, and even our cats, it's no fun for them um, a lot of the time. Uh, so what do you do? Well, you know, there's things you can do at home, you know, if you're prepared. And I've gotten a few calls this week, kind of like, all right, I was prepared on Saturday when July 4th was going off and I had the windows closed and the AC turned on and the fans going and the music going and the TV turned up loud just to kind of drown out any any fireworks or you know, this could be applied to thunderstorms, but it's those moments where you don't know it's happening uh, that, you know, all of a sudden your dog spooked and, you know, it's hard to get them, you know, from, you know, 11 down to one sort of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, for PD, you know, um, you know, there's certainly other therapies you can do. So there's things like the thunder shirt. So essentially a a fabric that you wrap around your your dog just to kind of comfort them. Um, there's uh, all natural uh, treats, you know, to help chill them out. Um, and then you start, you know, talking about other things like, um, you know, benzodiazepines and uh, other medications to help, uh, you know, kind of chill them out, you know. And um, that's, again, best addressed with your, your own veterinarian. Um, my one tip uh, to, to kind of try and prevent a storm phobia from happening is, uh, or a, you know, uh, a noise phobia from happening, is to make sure you're never comforting your dog when they're nervous. And that goes against every human nature thing we have, oh. us, you know, where, you know, we want to comfort something that looks scared. But as soon as you say, it's okay, PD, don't worry, PD, you know, or, or pet them or, you know, uh, get him his favorite toy or, or something like that. That's kind of rewarding him for being nervous. And so you pretty much just, you know, you don't have to be mean or callous, but you pretty much just go, yep, yeah, it's okay, bud. You know, thank you for letting me know and, and go on about your, your evening sort of thing. So interesting. Well, I've been again, screwing that up <laughs> again. If he's, you know, this is, if he's at, you know, two or three and we want to bring him back down to one, right. If he's already at 11, you know, you're not going to be able to get him uh, back down in the, in the normal range. So, so yeah, Phil, we can talk more about that since, since uh, we have a, a, a veterinary patient relationship. Yes. Well, uh, we've been at this for 40 minutes at this point, and uh, I think we've run out of questions. Thank you so much. I, I know I learned a lot. I'm assuming the folks watching did as well. Um, 
So thanks for sharing your expertise. And uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Phil, for having me. And thank you to Orvis for uh, putting this on. I look great. forward to the next one. And uh, if, uh, if you're watching this later and you have more questions, put them in the comments and uh, we'll do it again. All thanks right. again. Good night, Bo. Thanks. Good night. Take care.